series of Bible studies, or in fact, it's not going to be a series in the sense that the subjects will hang together. They'll be all quite uh, separate. And uh, I tell you that at this point, and also to say that uh, I love uh, informal Bible studies with very little in the way of what sometimes we call preliminaries. I'm sure we shouldn't, because praising God is never a preliminary. But you know what I mean? That which comes before the the preached and taught ministry of the word that somehow gets the preacher up on his feet a little fresher than being worn out as I sometimes am by very, very long-winded services before you ever get around to, to preaching. And I love that. And it means gracious <coughs> and 55 I'm already on my feet. And to let you know that our aim, preachers hit the target, but our aim is that uh, we should be true by uh, 11.30. Well, that's John, uh, the other John picking up house just now, uh, he looked uh, horrified. He went all pale because I was carrying my electric shaver with him. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, this fellow's going to have a break, have time out at around four o'clock, have a shave so that he looks decent for the end of the message. Well, not really as bad as that. The, the shaver's got sick and needs taken to the doctor. That's the answer to that one. And so we'll try to attend to that uh, at the end of our Bible study uh, today thank the pastor for mentioning the books. He's improved over the years. When I first came here, he used to smuggle those books away in a place where nobody could find them. <laughs> and part of the trick during the week was to engage in a treasure hunt, I think, and if you were fortunate enough to find them stuck in some other building, different to the one we were in, can you imagine that, um, then you were fortunate enough to get one. Well, it's improving as the years go by. Uh, at least in that regard, I can't say anything about it. In the other regard, and uh, we've actually reached the stage where we have them in the very building where we're holding the meetings and the services. This is incredible. And uh, one or two folk this morning have asked if they'd be available at this gathering, at this study, and they are. And if I can find out by looking around which ones that are there, I might just um, explain uh, one or two of them at the end, but we'll leave them until the very Turn with me to Psalm 37, to the 37th Psalm, which is one of the Psalms of David. Not all of the 150 Psalms were written by David, but this particular one was. And it was apparently written in some particular circumstances, and we'll uh, come to that in a moment. I want to read the first seven verses then jump on to verse 34. Do not fret because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither, like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord, and do good. Dwell in the land, and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. And he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Verse 34. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land when the wicked are cut off, you will see it. I have seen a wicked and ruthless man flourishing like a green tree in its native soil, but he soon passed away and was no more. Though I looked for him, he could not be found. Consider the blameless. Observe the upright. There is a future for the man of peace, but all sinners will be destroyed. The future of the wicked will be cut off. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold. In time of trouble, the Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in Him. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, as we come to your word, we want yet again to ask that you will graciously do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. Open your word to our hearts open our hearts to your word. Give to each one of us the grace of understanding, the greater grace of obedience. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sure 
true that if you are a Christian or someone who has read the Bible uh, for some time and the two are not necessarily the same, uh, you will have discovered how often if you have just a few moments to read, uh, perhaps in the middle of the day or whatever, at the beginning of the day if you're in a hurry or at the end of the day if you're tired, you turn to the Psalms, the Psalms and the Proverbs. I think that's sometimes why, and the was mentioning it a little earlier, uh, we uh, sometimes have a New Testament and the Psalms and the Proverbs uh, published together, the rest of the Bible being omitted, not because the publishers don't think the Old Testament is part of God's Word, but uh, the New Testament is sometimes published separately, and then sometimes the Psalms and the Proverbs are tacked on at the end. Because they are so uh, devotional, I suppose is a word, but not a very good word, um, because they seem to speak so directly, so obviously to our circumstances. There seems to be a psalm for every circumstance that you can imagine. I doubt whether there's a situation in life to which one of the psalms doesn't speak in one form, in one way or another. Now, David wrote Psalm 37 when the going uh, was rather tough. We'll call him a Christian. You'll know what I mean by that. He was a Christian before Christ came, if you know what I mean. He was a believer, and all the benefits that Christians have through trusting in Christ, David had, although Christ had not yet come uh, to the earth. And Psalm 37, when David was, uh, well, he was feeling rather downcast. And uh, what was happening was that the unrighteous seemed to be fit, fat, and flourishing, and the righteous, the believers, seemed to have it uh, very tough indeed. They were oppressed and oppressed and depressed. But as he writes the psalm, the Holy Spirit uh, shows him the truth of the situation and shows him the way of blessing. And uh, we can get the, the sense of what I've said there in Psalm 1. Do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong for like the grass they will soon wither like green plants, they will soon dry away and so on. So here is David having meditated about the whole thing uh, saying, now look, don't do what it would seem he had been tempted to do, which was to fret himself, we may come to that word later, it means get all hot and bothered. It's exactly what it means. It means to heat yourself. Don't, don't get overheated uh, about the prosperity of the wicked. Don't let that concern you. Uh, they're going to be like grass. It, it grows up for a little while. It looks great and it's green and flourishing. But in a little while, the, the hot summer winds will come and it will die away and you'll never see it uh, again. And that really is uh, a substantial theme within the whole psalm. But as I say, the psalm is laced through with the uh, teaching of how we may know God's blessing uh, in today's world. And it all centers, of course, around our relationship to the Lord. So I want to pick up uh, five of these phrases that occur in Psalm 37, take them in the order in which they occur, and in fact they also occur in a very helpful order in terms of, of their meaning, and I think we'll pick that up as we go along. Here's the first, in verse 3. Trust in the Lord. Which does say more than that, it says trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land, and enjoy safe pasture. But the real essence of it is this, to trust in the Lord. Now, that's where we begin. That's where we must begin. Uh, we seem to be beginning at the beginning this week, which is, I'm sure is the right place to begin. <coughs> Sunday morning, when I spoke on the new birth, and uh, last night on uh, how to be sure, how to test ourselves as to whether we truly were Christians. We remember, I hope, those of you who were there, first of all, we need to be convinced about Christ, we need to be convicted by Him, we need to be converted to Him. So it all, it all hinges around our relationship with Christ, and uh, that is where we must begin. And lo and behold, we have it again here. The first step, the absolutely the first step to living a secure life in an insecure world is that we trust in the Lord. Now, I put it to you that there is nothing more sensible, there's nothing more rational, there's nothing more reasonable than to trust in the Lord. Now, we trust in lots of people uh, that we don't know, that we don't know anything about. Uh, people who in other circumstances may not be trustworthy. My wife and I spend a great deal of our time in the course of our ministry flying from one place to the other. Now, I can't think of any um, obvious 
uh, natural day-by-day -day situation that more embodies what I want to say than that we trust <coughs> so many people when we get on board an airplane. We flew in that little Saab plane down from uh, DFW on Saturday. And maybe the smaller the plane, the better the illustration. I don't know about you, but I've flown in everything from 747s to two-seaters, and somehow the element of trust seems to be greater in the two-seater than it does in the 747. And uh, there we are in that little sub, and I guess it takes 30 <coughs> people or so, and uh, we put our trust absolutely, totally, in that pilot and his co-pilot, and the people who uh, fueled the plane, the people, if you want to go further back, who constructed the plane, the people who put the last nuts and bolts and rivets in it, uh, the people who checked it, the person who signed a certificate of airworthiness for that particular plane, the people who serviced it at DFW, whatever. Uh, by the end of the day, we were committing our lives, trusting our lives totally to probably hundreds of different people, people we've never seen, people of whom we knew nothing, people who may beat their wives, or may get drunk at weekends, or uh, some may have a drug problem, some may be dishonest in their business deals. Uh, who knows uh, about them? We don't know anything about them, but we absolutely trust it. There's a delightful story of George Shearing, the uh, blind American uh, pianist, brilliant uh, musician, who was traveling by plane one day across the states, and as some of these planes do, they stop and you're allowed to deplane for a while and get on board and the flight uh, continues. He had his, uh, his uh, guide dog with him. And uh, they were, people were invited to deplane and he, uh, he decided not to, but just to sit there. And uh, after a while, the pilot got out of the cabin and saw Shearing, the only man left in the plane with his dog, and said, wouldn't you like to deplane for a little while? We'll be down another 30 minutes. And Shearing said, no, I don't think I'll bother. And the pilot said, well, do you think the dog would appreciate mm -hmm. getting out for a walk? And she said, well, I'm sure he would. I said, I'll take it. And so the pilot took the dog and went down the steps and made his way into the terminal, and everybody who was about to get on the flight canceled. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this pilot needs a dog to find his way around. I think maybe we'll you know, go, go with Delta and <laughs> or uh, whoever else. Now, uh, we put our trust in people who don't see you turn on the tap and water and get some water from and drink it. You're trusting hundreds of people, not only whom you've not seen, that is to say, after all, with the Lord, but of whom you know nothing. You don't know anything about them, except that you are going to assume that they are competent at their job and that we have so organized our society uh, that they would be accountable if they were not up to snuff in doing their job properly and in providing uh, the service that they were supposed to provide. Now, if we can trust people like that, if we can uh, stop at a red light when it turns green, drive across, trusting some other driver on the other side, male or female, uh, trusting them absolutely that they're not going to do a stupid thing and start driving across when their line is red, if we can do that to our fellow human beings, how much more reasonable is it to trust in the law? We've not seen God. Of course we have. No man can see God and live, the scripture tells us. Of course we've not seen God with the eye of flesh. But do we not know enough about him? Have we not enough revealed about him in the scriptures to cause us to trust him? Faith may be a leap in the dark, as it's been called, but it's a leap in the dark onto a rock that we know is there. That's it. In fact, the scripture tells us in uh, Romans 1 that God has revealed, I paraphrase, has revealed enough of himself in creation that man is without excuse. You say, but there are some people who have never heard the gospel, they've never heard somebody going through the gospels or the epistles of the Romans and so forth. How can they be expected to trust the Lord when they've not had the kind of Bible teaching that we have had? The Bible says, the man looks up, and I'm now, of course, uh, elaborating what it, it is saying and explaining what it means, person can look up and see the sun, the moon, the stars above his head. He's now without excuse. He does not worship God. He looks out and sees a mountain, a river, a tree, a bird, the creation of the universe around him, and doesn't trust God, believe in God, commit himself to God. That man is utterly without excuse, the scripture tells us. 
So the first of these commands, and bear that in mind, they are commands. Maybe I'll make a point about that. I recall someone uh, saying to me once, perhaps on more than one occasion, do you think the Bible, does the Bible have any advice on such and such a subject? Now, before they have told me what the subject is, I know what my answer is to their question. That is, no, the Bible has no advice. Now, they seem quite surprised about that. You mean the Bible's got no advice about that? No, no advice, whatever. In fact, the Bible's got no advice about anything. The reason is that God is not an advisor. See, an advisor is someone that you go to. You go to a financial advisor. You know, you've inherited yet another million. You don't know what to do with it. You know that problem. A terrible problem to have. And, uh, and uh, you go to a financial advisor. And he says, well, tell me your, your circumstances. Tell me all you can about yourself now. This is the best advice I have at the moment. This is my advice. Now, of course, if the government should change, if this should happen, if war breaks out in the Middle East, if so and so, this may not turn out to be good advice, but it's the best advice I can offer you. But that's all he is, an advisor. Now, God is not an advisor. God isn't someone who says to us, well, as far as I can tell, given all the present circumstances, this is your best shot. Of course, I may be wrong, and things may turn out very different, in which case I've given you bad advice. Now, God is not like that. God doesn't give us advice. God gives us directions. God gives us instructions. God gives us warnings. God gives us promises. But he doesn't give us advice. He's not an advice. So, I make that point to say that all of these five points that we're going to look at are commands. They're directions. And the first is that we should trust in the law. Trust. Trust in the law. Here's the second. Verse 4. Delight yourself in the law. Now, surely that takes things a stage further. After all, you trust in a machine, a piece of equipment. Go back to my original illustration. You trust in an airplane. But it would hardly be true to say that you delight in it. I happen to have... Uh, Quite a fascination with airplanes. I don't mean an obsession, it's not even a hobby. I don't keep pictures of airplanes around my walls or anything. But uh, after flying what must now be thousands of times, uh, literally thousands of times, I still uh, look forward to the next flight. I, I, it's just, and I can't stand heights. That would be crazy. I get dizzy standing on the sidewalk. Uh, I can't stand heights, but, but uh, I go up in an airplane with a drop of a hand because I just enjoy uh, that particular experience. But I don't delight in airplanes. They're not things that, in that sense, make me purr with pleasure. But when I stop at a red light at a stop sign and uh, until it turns green and move on, I have trusted in that piece of machinery, but I don't delight in it. I don't say to a visitor to town, I want to come, come on, I'll show you this stop line. It's just absolutely lovely. I just admire and adore this stop line. You can come and see it. That would be ridiculous. On the other hand, I recall when we returned to our hometown, my wife and I come from Little Island in, uh, just off the south coast of England, the island of Guernsey, which is much closer to France than England, is in fact part of the United Kingdom. And I recall when we went uh, back to the island on one occasion, soon after we'd come into the uh, ministry, uh, a young couple that we knew, in fact, I was the best man at his wedding, invited us to come and see his new house. New house built, wanted us to come and see it. We must have been outside of that house 30 minutes before we ever got inside it. They wanted to show us around the, the flower garden and around the backyard and this and that. And I think every fence and every post and every <coughs> blade of grass and the, and the line of the house and the, the coloring and the roof and all the rest of it. And then we went inside and it was upstairs and downstairs. It was just every room we had to look at and admire. He not only uh, possessed it, he delighted in it. He rejoiced in it. He was thrilled to bits about it, and he had every right to be in a pretty large house, but it was very it was very pleasant and comfortable. He had it built to his own specifications, and he was the kind of person who knew exactly what he wanted, and it was something in which he delighted. He said, well, that sounds a strange uh, kind of illustration to use, and strange wording to use about our relationship with God. But you know, Many years ago, centuries ago, there was a great piece of, uh, a great document called the, the Shorter Catechism, which the Puritans and others 
uh, since been used in uh, and more of the pity that it's not in, in uh, as widespread use as it should be today in examining people about the truths of scripture. And the very first question in the shorter catechism is this, what is the chief end of man? In other words, what is the ultimate uh, purpose for which man is created and the goal to which he should be uh, aiming his life? And the answer to the first question, what is the chief end of man, is this. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Now, what a tremendous phrase that is. Man's chief end. The bottom line, as you would say in the United States, the bottom line is that we should know God, that we should come to know Him, that we should come to trust Him, and more than that, that we should come to enjoy Him, to glorify God, and to enjoy Him forever. Now let me ask whether you enjoy your relationship with the Lord. There's a difference between trusting a piece of mechanism and enjoying a relationship with the person. Say so again, it takes us that one step deeper, and it's intended to do so. Here's the third. Verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. And it repeats the trust in him uh, phrase after that. Trust in him and he will do this. But let's concentrate on the first one. Commit your way to the Lord. And I, I believe again that it follows on. It dovetails in to the first one. First of all, trust in the Lord. Abandon yourself to him. Acknowledge his sovereignty, his glory, his power. And, and yield your life to him. Commit your life to him, if you will. Uh, secondly, enjoy him. Enjoy the Lord. And now, commit your way to him. Phrase your way answers in scripture again and again to your life. And now we're getting down to the details of your life. The details of your daily life. Commit your way to him. There's a version of the Bible called the Amplified Bible. It's... Uh, it's not a paraphrase. It's much, much better than a paraphrase. And it's not, but it's not an accurate translation. It's exactly what it says it is. It's an amplification. Uh, and sometimes it's rather wearisome to read because uh, if the same word occurs in a short passage a number of times, it repeats all the, all the synonyms of that particular word. And it would, be, it would be impossible to use it in public reading, for instance. But for study, it can be super. And uh, I have often used it in that regard. And for instance, instead of saying commit your way to the Lord, it says commit and roll and repose each care of your road on him. Let me give you another example. In Psalm 55, <coughs> verse 22, which says cast your burden on the Lord, the Amplified Bible says releasing the weight of it. Cast your burden on the Lord, releasing the weight of it. Here's another verse of scripture which says very much the same thing. Casting, uh, 1 Peter 5, 7 is what I have in mind here. The uh, King James Version reads, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. But uh, we can do better than that in terms of translation. The NIV, I believe, is much more helpful when it says this. Cast all your anxiety on him, for he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety upon Let me illustrate the meaning of that by telling you what the French Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 7. The verb it uses is déchargez-vous. And déchargez-vous is the word you would use about a, about a truck uh, that has a lever there in the cab which the driver presses and the back of the truck turns over and all the load is discharged onto the, the dump or the road or whatever it is. The picture is irresistible. Uh, surely, I think that's a perfect illustration of exactly what that particular verb means. Reach the point where these anxieties are burdening you, these problems, these traumas, these difficulties. Now, the instruction is, and remember, it's not just a suggestion, it's not advice. The instruction is that we learn, that we learn the secret of discharging, of unloading. It's not too crude a word to use of unloading the problem on the law. Not because, and I was trying to uh, tell the young people this on Saturday night, 
not because uh, God is there to answer our problems. And mm -hmm. if we can get along without God so much better, we get along with those seem to be problems in life, that's fine. And then when a problem comes, we say, now we know exactly where to go to dump our problems. God is not a receptacle for dumping our problems. God is God with whom we are meant to have a constant and loving relationship. But part of the promise that he makes to us is that if we will learn, and it's difficult to learn, maybe that's where the illustration just breaks down a little bit. A truck driver can learn where that button or that lever is, and he presses it or pulls it, and the load is discharged, and he could do that in his sleep. It's an automatic thing. Uh, he is loaded up, he presses the button, and the load is discharged, and that's it. I do want to avoid giving the impression that as we go through life and these problems and burdens come to us, that uh, there's just a button that we press and the problem goes away. It's not as easy as that. We have to learn the discipline of trusting the Lord in the anxieties of life and of coming to Him and of discharging that loan upon Him. There's a delightful illustration of a Christian lady who lived in London during World War II when the uh, German bombers began to come over and discharge just thousands of bombs on the city. Of course, many, many people were killed. It was great devastation. And uh, a system was set up of air raid shelters. People used to sleep in the subway uh, at night, or they used to build what were known as Anderson shelters in their own home. Where they, they learned to, to uh, get under the, the stairwell of their houses when the bombs were falling and so forth. And uh, sirens were sounded when the bombers were approaching to give people notice of all that. And this particular Christian lady had an unnerving habit of uh, just ignoring them and staying in her bed and sleeping and so forth. And some friends said to her, well, uh, that's not a very wise thing to do. When you hear the siren, you're meant to get up and go to the safest place you can find uh, until the, you hear another sound, which is the all clear. Uh, don't you think you... Uh, ought to stay awake and listen to the first sign of danger, and when it comes, you ought to rush to a place of safety. And her reply was, no, I don't think I'm going to do that at all. I've committed my way to the law. And the Bible tells me that God neither slumbers nor sleeps. And I don't see any point in both of us staying awake. <laughs> now, that was a very simple thing to say. That may have been a simplistic thing to say. It was actually a rather silly thing to say. Uh, I think that a, a Christian's proper responsibility was to uh, do all that he could to ensure his safety and trust uh, in the Lord anyway, and trust in the Lord even, as Job said, even though he slain. But let me just give, make one other point about this verse, which does have to be looked at in so many different ways. The first Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Old Testament basically was written in Hebrew, and the first Greek <coughs> translation of it, called the Septuagint, because there were 70 men involved in it, translates it like this, reveal your way unto the law. Now, I mean, that gives us the clue as to what it all means. And of course, it's talking about prayer. It is take it to the Lord in prayer, as Joseph Scriven has. It is, oh, what peace you often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God. What this verse is saying is that when these burdens, these problems, these perplexities, these difficulties come in our life, what we have to do is to reveal our way to the Lord. Of course, the Lord knows all about it already. But we're not to trade on that. Our Father, to give another illustration, knows what we need before we ask Him, Jesus said in the sermon. That doesn't mean we're not to ask Him. It doesn't mean we're not to ask Him for help and strength and blessing. Upon, upon our lives. Uh, God knows we need those things, but he still requires, commands us to ask him. And this verse says, reveal your way to the Lord. In the words of another hymn writer, all your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. And that's so often is the difficulty. We we'll take it to the Lord in prayer, we we'll tell the Lord all about it, and we we'll take the burden up again, and off we go as a miserable as we were when we came to the Lord in prayer. And it is a discipline. Uh, it is a grace that God will surely give us if we're concerned to have it, that we take the burden to the Lord and we leave it there. 
We don't take the burden to the Lord, tell him about it, and resume the burden and carry on. We take it to the Lord and we leave it there. <coughs> Commit your way unto the Lord. And then here's the fourth. In verse 7. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Now that's a good translation. The uh, King James Version has rest in the Lord, but that needs to be explained. And I believe it is it is fairly well explained by the NIVs. Be still before the Lord. Literally it means to be silent before the Lord. To be still literally means to be silent. And remember the context of the psalm. Look back again uh, at verse 1. Do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. You see, the context of the psalm is, why are the ungodly prospering? Why is God allowing this to happen? Why are there people who don't even believe that there is a God? And they seem as healthy as people who <coughs> believe there is. Why are there people who never go to church, never bow the knee in prayer, never open the sacred page, never seek to give thanks to God, not even for their daily food, never acknowledge God in their life. You see, they seem to be as prosperous as anyone else. They don't seem to be hurting because of it. Is it worthwhile being a Christian? Is it worthwhile trusting God? Does it seem to do us any good? Does it seem to get us any further than to get some of those people? Well, that is the, that is the context of the psalm, and perhaps in particular, verse 7, uh, points to an even wider context, which is, here I am doing my best to be a Christian, to seek and to trust the Lord and to follow Him, and now look what's happening to me. Look what God is allowing to happen in my life. Look at the problems I'm facing, and the pain, and the hurt, and I'm trusting the Lord. Well, the command is, <coughs> be still before the Lord. In other words, don't argue with God. Be prepared to accept what it is that God is sending or allowing in your life uh, without chiding Him and without accusing Him of wrongdoing. Many of you know the story of Joni Erickson. Joni Erickson Tada, she now is, who uh, as a teenager, I went to the river that day to swim and was a paraplegic from that day now, a very fine Christian lady whose faith has developed, matured, I believe in a very marked way as the years have gone on, whose writings have matured. And uh, in her very latest book, uh, I believe uh, we have some of the finest things that she's ever uh, said. And this after 17 years of being uh, confined to a wheelchair. <coughs> Listen to what Joni has to say. When we learn to lean back in God's sovereignty, fixing and settling our thoughts on that unshakable, unmovable reality, we can experience great inner peace. Now listen to this. Our troubles may not change. Our pain may not diminish. Our loss may not be restored. Our problems may not fade with the dawn, but the power of those things to harm us is broken as we rest in the fact that God <coughs> is in control. That's great. That's tremendous truth there. I believe that's a, an outworking of the command here to be still before the Lord. Anybody who thinks that you can answer in a glib kind of way what God is doing, why things aren't working out, that we can press a button and things will work out, I believe is, uh, is living in cloud to do that. That is not what New Testament Christianity is all about. That's one of the reasons why I believe there is a sense in which, I want to be careful how I say this, it's virtually impossible to capture New Testament Christianity on television. It is virtually impossible to present it in a, in a television show. In fact, the very word Television, sh the words television show, have, in my view, nothing to do with New Testament Christianity. It cannot be reduced to simplicities like that. And uh, I think we need to be very careful of what we watch and how much we watch. 
I was in a home the other day of what I thought were maturing Christians. They told me at one TV show that they were, they were watching some Christian television show and clearly watching it regularly every week. And I couldn't believe it. <coughs> I, uh, I wanted to be careful. They were my hosts, and I did want them dinner that day. I had to be careful about what I said. Uh, but clearly something of what I said indicated uh, that I wasn't very happy about that. And this person actually said, but he's got such a lovely smile. Now, uh, I was horrified. I mean, goodness gracious, I wouldn't watch a guy with a lovely smile and be this spouting nonsense, which that particular creature happens to do regularly. Um, I think that was terrible. He's got such a, such a nice smile and such a good show. I'm not interested in a person's smile or a show. I'm interested in the truth. I'm interested in, in genuine, robust New Testament Christianity. And New Testament Christianity has a lot of question marks that we will never have answered this side of heaven. We must settle for that. And there are times when we need to be silent before God and say, I don't know, absolutely don't know. I don't know why you're doing this, why you're allowing this, why I should be hurting, but I'm still trusting. See, many of these characters today uh, are giving us the impression uh, that there's a solution to everything, a solution that we can know here and now. If we press the right button, all the pieces will fall into place and we'll have all the answers. Well, what does the Bible mean then when it talks about living by faith and not by sight? We walk by faith. In other words, there are times when we cannot trace God, but we are to trust Him where we cannot trace Him. Where we say, well, I don't see I don't see how that works out. I don't see how that fits in to what I know about God. There's the clue. I do not know how that fits in, but I do know God. And I'm going to trust God and never let what I don't know upset the things I do know. And then finally, in our time is about up. Uh, in fact, it was up in 45 seconds ago, to be exact. But then I didn't make a promise, did I? Just gave you general suggestions. <laughs> Verse 34, we read right over to it, wait for the law. And the Amplified Bible translates that, wait for and expect the law. And I believe that's a, that gives us a final touch to the picture. Uh, expect the law. All of our uncertainties as we go through life, and our pains, and our problems, and our problems, and our problems, are against this background that though our problems may be lasting, they are not everlasting. And they're not everlasting for two reasons. Not just because we will not live on this earth forever. <coughs> and if we are Christians, we are going to a place where there is no pain, sorrow, darkness, and loss, and hurt, and sin, but because the Lord Jesus will return. And that may come before the end of our natural lives. And it doesn't matter whether we are 18 years of age or whether we are 18 years of age. The Lord may return before the natural end of our lives. And here is David, way off in those days, when you think how little is revealed in the Old Testament compared to the New, about all of God's character, and his promises and so forth, here is David, even in those way off, we may call them in those dark days, still saying, this is something that is to be put into the picture when you face the perplexities of life. The Lord Jesus is returning. James says towards the end of the New Testament, be patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draws near. And it does. And we don't know when it's going to be. Of course, I imagine it's true that in any given day we would say, well, let's uh, see why this should be the day when the Lord will return. I'm reminded of Robert Murray McShane, great Scottish preacher, many years ago, died when he was about 30 years of age. And I recall the story of meeting with one of his friends. And they were discussing the second coming of Christ. And one of his friends said to McShane, do you think the Lord is coming today? I don't know when he's coming. Nobody knows when he's coming. So that's not what I asked. I said, but do you think he's coming today? Okay. Well, I've got no reason for knowing, but I just kind of said, but do you think, do you think he's coming today? And the said, well, if you put it like that, 
No, I don't think he's coming today. His friend said, now let me tell you what the scripture says. Such a time as you think not, he will. So it's going to be on one of those days when you think he is. He does. Now, I'm not going to join the ranks of those prophets, pseudo-prophets, uh, who uh, write books of uh, the second coming, give us the terrible timetable, some having to rush out new editions of their books, I imagine that, in the Middle East situation, Russia suddenly has a perspective of the rest of it. I've enjoyed those ranks, I'm not an expert in that field at all. But I'm satisfied to rest on this, the Lord is coming. His coming is certain, and it will be sudden. It may be soon, and we have to be ready for it. One of the ways in which we have to be ready for it is to live as if we were certain it was going to happen. And we are going to trust in the Lord, we are going to trust in where we cannot fail. In fact, to follow through the five points of our psalm, we are going to trust in the Lord, delight ourselves in the Lord, commit our way to the Lord, be silent before the Lord, we can't understand what happened, and we are to wait for it. Tiptoe knowing that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall see him. Let's bow our heads and pray together. When we pray, let me just take a moment, if I can, and be able to discover what we have available, just a word of explanation about the table. Father, we thank you for your wonderful word. Thank you that these words, which were written thousands of years ago, have such an impact today because they are part of the living and enduring word of God. Help us to trust you and delight in you, commit our way to you, be silent before you, and to wait patiently for the coming of the Lord Jesus. Hear us and help us, go before us into the hours of this day. Help us to walk worthy of the gospel in which we were called. Prepare us worship and praise the preaching of the evening hour.